Um, I'm James Raven and it's a great pleasure to welcome you all to uh, Mark's Hall this morning for this very special event um, which we hope uh, you will all be able to participate in as the day unfolds. Uh, I thought I'd uh, first of all give a few acknowledgements of our thanks both to the University of Essex and to Mark's Hall trustees for their help and support today. Um, but also to the Economic and Social Research Council who uh, have very generously funded the project which you will be hearing about today for the recovery of the lost mansion, the lost mansion site on Marks Hall. And in respect of that, I'm very um, pleased to welcome a number of, of, of guests today. Um, Jane Pearson, of course, who I'll introduce in a, in a moment, uh, one of the members of the Marks Hall recovery team and uh, Dr. Gabriel uh, Mashenko from, uh, the univers from University College London, who will be speaking this afternoon, and whose new book on archaeology and the Second World War is published today. Uh, I'm sure he'll be able to give a, a further detail of that later. Um, but also uh, a number of people who will be uh, here helping us today as well um, from Braintree District Council and from Essex County Council, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Councillor uh, Joanne Beavis, Councillor Sue Wilson, and Robert Rose, um, who is um, the museum manager uh, at Braintree. And we're very pleased also to welcome David Andrews, who is formerly um, head of uh, Historic Buildings uh, of Essex County Council, and many others more besides, who you will, I'm sure, meet during the day. And I do hope we'll actually be able to have an opportunity to meet each other as well as the day progresses. I wanted very, very briefly just to open this with some general historic context to Mark's Hall, the estate, and uh, the mansion, the lost mansion, and what we have been doing here over the, over the last two years. Because I know for some of you, not all of you by any means, for some of you it's unfamiliar. Others will have heard us talk about it, various aspects of it during the last two years. But I just wanted to give some context before I hand over to Jane Pearson who um, is going to um, uh, uh, coordinate and chair the, the morning's um, presentation about oral history and what it tells us about the landscape of Marks Hall. So here we have um, the original mansion house and we can see, I'm sure you know, it's sited uh, between uh, Coggeshall and Earl's Cone. Uh, a site that we know was mentioned in Doomsday and probably goes back before Doomsday. And an estate, and again, Jane, we're rushing through a few here, um, that extensive estate of about 3,000 acres today. And the red dot shows the site of the mansion house. We don't have many um, representations of the mansion house before photography. Uh, but here is an early sketch of it on uh, an estate map from 1764. At a time, and the important family for us, the Honeywood family who um, bought the estate uh, at the very end of the 16th century and who built the uh, lost mansion, the mansion that we associate. <clears throat> it was, there, were, there were other houses before this one, but this is the main Jacobean mansion. This is a view uh, in the 1920s as taken by Country Life. We're very fortunate that Country Life took so many excellent photographs. Just a representation of, of one of the most famous members of the Honeywood family, General Philip Honeywood, in a, 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 a painting by Gainsborough which once hung in the, in the mansion, is these days uh, in Florida. But it's a very fine portrait. He was uh, much battle-scarred, he was a great hero, and it's said that uh, only the thickness of the pigtail of his wig at the back saved him from death when a musket ball lodged in the pigtail at the back. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. There we are. Next, please. The, um, the Honeywoods in the 19th century went through what would, I suppose, be an equivalent of Jarndyce versus Jarndyce in the sense that there was a legal suit between aspect, two, two parts of the Honeywood family and also there were problems over inheritance as well. And at the end of the 19th century, the Honeywood period came to an end and the mansion was bought <clears throat> by uh, Thomas Phillips Price. There he is seated under one of the great oaks of the estate. And uh, he was determined to leave the estate 
with its mansion to the nation. At one point, indeed, he thought of it as being a sec possibly a second Kew Gardens when Kew was in some difficulties with the smog uh, in London. And his will left uh, the estate to the nation. Uh, but after his death in uh, 1932, his widow, who you see seated with him there, um, was uh, basically in, in residence and in, at least informally in charge of the estate. And through a whole series of very unfortunate circumstances, the estate was transformed between then and her death in 1966. Um, most prominently, um, because of the wartime, and we'll be hearing a lot today about the war, <clears throat> particularly this afternoon, and we're very interested in the history of the war, of course, with memories of, of its wartime occupation. At one point, 5,000 airmen occupied this site with um, the American Air Force and the RAF. And there's a, a rather nice aerial photograph of it. Um, but <clears throat> at the end of the war, partly through the damage to the house and through other circumstances which we're very interested in, in researching and understanding, the mansion in its damaged condition and also very difficult to maintain and with all of its huts around it um, was left in a very precarious state and ultimately in uh, 19, January 1950 uh, it was demolished. I think, well, that's the mansion during its demolition. So today we're, we're all concentrating on um, memory. Well, I, I think also we should, shouldn't forget the church. You can see the church there to the uh, right of the mansion house which also, um, there's a nice close-up of it from a, one of the sales catalogues, and it was demolished, uh, the first thing to go really, in 19, early 1930s. And I think we've got a cutting, can, with this one picture of the church, should come up out in rubble. Um, the site is also viewable today. But we're talking today very much about memory and what we can, in, in terms of how we might be able to recreate the site, not just in terms of, of the available images and pictures that we have, um, but also what people's memories might be of this estate. And it's useful, I think, also to think of it not necessarily also in isolation, that this is a general phenomenon, after the, particularly after the Second World War, of the loss of a very large number of great estates and great houses um, across, the, across the nation, but also in Essex. This was one of the first ones uh, to be photographed by Country Life. Uh, it's a house in um, Lincolnshire, which was destroyed early in the century. And I'm just showing a few, and I think, Jane, if you just press that. Um, this will just show you the losses of other great houses in Essex. First of all, these coming up are before the war. and then in the pink losses after the war. It's quite interesting also to see actually where they are in relation. Of course, land was at a premium near to London, so there was particular interest in reclaiming some of the houses, and also so many houses were severely damaged by war. Others weren't, and others were more of a case of the, uh, the history of the overextension of the country estate. So interesting, actually, is this as a phenomenon that what we're doing here in Marks Hall is also we want very much to link it to the history of great estates and their loss, the loss of mansions and the loss of estates. And for those of you who are interested, and we'll have a, a flyer for this later, on July the 13th, Saturday, July the 13th, we're having a major international conference of speakers from different parts of the world talking particularly about the loss of houses uh, in Britain and Ireland, the world that we associate with Downton Abbey and Gosford Park and the recreation and where, but we tend not to think about its loss about the overextension of the estate. And although we, many of us visit estates, we don't so often, I think, see uh, or think about all those that were lost. There's a few local ones. Those who know Colchester will know the loss of Beer Church, a vast estate, uh, and a few more, Rolls Park and Chiswell, Mark Hall, demolished in 1960, much later, uh, and Stoppers, and there are many more. And then we can just, can we see the our own Marks Hall in the middle there of Essex. So, say we have a few representations, um, and indeed, my own <coughs> there's a, a nice early 19th century print. My own association 
with this estate was because uh, as a boy I was taken to see what was then the estate before the trustees um, uh, took over the estate on behalf of the nation in, in the early 1970s. I was taken in the 60s as a boy to see it in ruins because my great-great-grandfather was a gardener on the estate in the early 19th century and family oral memory told me a lot about this estate and so um, later when there was an opportunity to join um, the board as a trustee I really couldn't uh, resist it and I like uh, fancifully to imagine that the gardener here sort of pulling his forelock to the Honeywood family is actually my great-great-grandfather William Raven but we also said we also have some marvellous images from the country life selection and people have also been very generous to us in giving us a large number of, of other photographic uh, images, other evidence from which we can start to reconstruct the Mansion House site and the Mansion House. And one of our, our aims is to think about it in a, as it were, a, a multimedia way as well, that we might be able to offer uh, future visitors a way of re-envisaging the site through uh, digital means, different visual enactments, as well as oral uh, means to actually hear people's memories of the site, as well as um, oh, this is just this is this is um, the, the uh, a view of the mansion as it was left, sort of in the in the 1950s, early 60s, as uh, the um, undergrowth began to take it over. But this is how I remember it, um, without the mansion. And that's very much, of course, and we'll have a, a tour onto the site later to see what's, what's happening, both the World War II site and also the mansion site, so that you can get a sense um, of progress, too, in recreating and re-envisaging it. The archaeology began, and it's very nice to see John Camps and, and Francis Nichols, patron of the Trust, uh, who have been very much involved with the Colchester Archaeological Group and the Colchester Archaeological Trust, uh, in steering through this. We're now on the, at least the second, it's in, I think John's there, John Mallinson at the back there, also um, uh, directing the archaeology, which uh, has been on the site for the last uh, two years, and we will be discussing and seeing that later. And we'll be able to, that's just an early plan, but the idea will also be to be able to once again see on the ground level the uh, outline of, at least, the very least, the outline of the rooms and also have some interpretation of what went on in those rooms and what they looked like to give some sense of an understanding of what, after all, was the centre of the estate um, but is no longer there and we hope will be a, a fine adjunct to the beautiful gardens, the arboretum, and everything that people come to Mark's Hall to visit now will have an additional um, point of interest on the estate. So there's the mansion again. As I said, there's a social, there's a social dimension here, and it's the social dimension that we really um, want to uh, look into today in terms of memory and the landscape of the of the of the of the um, park. Country life always um, always has its dishy deb at the beginning, doesn't it? This is Henrietta Tiarks. Um, uh, so, and I think she may transmogrify into Mrs. Mrs. Price in a moment. <laughs> And <laughs> try, try again. Um, but the interesting thing is that it's overlaid. It's overlaid, of course, by recreation and dramatization and popularizations. And so it's very interesting to get below the surface of that. And as a social and cultural historian, I'm particularly interested, and Jane is particularly interested as well, to understand uh, how we unpick memory and what memory can actually tell us about about a site, um, particularly ones which can become politically quite controversial, uh, and Overly, overlay the different memories and different, uh, different histories we have. The site itself, as a historian, I think is very interesting because it's a wonderful working example of how history is not simple and history is a, 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 a narrative of conflict, of conflicted memories, of how we all have a different way of remembering something. And it's somehow that we actually have to bring those different memories together to bear to create a, a narrative, and a narrative which has different viewpoints, different perspectives. Um, and so... We, we really want to ask, you know, what do we remember and, uh, you know, in what, and how do we remember it? Final question not coming up. Oh, yes, it is. How do we remember it? And within this, of course, as well as the, as the photographs that we have and the memories, we've also been very fortunate in reclaiming a number of some of the original artefacts. The sale was a very dramatic sale in January 1950, in which the auctioneer moved into the site and literally the house was stripped bare. Um, everything in it 
was sold off, uh, and then the, the actual fabric of the building was sold as well. The roof tiles, the beams, the bricks, and, and then um, and sold on the, and the final demolition. Nothing was left at all of it. And we, people have been very generous in giving us various things that were from the house or associated with the house um, over the years. Some, some actually part of the sale, others that we've, we, we do extend a general amnesty to anyone locally who took a stone or something where we're very pleased to have it, have it back. But also other, other things which people um, have been generously giving to the trust uh, over the years which are associated in general with the estate. And I think at that point I hand over to Jane um, to explain how that develops into the next session this morning. Thank you. And do you want to sit here and do my slides? Brilliant, excellent. Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm heading up the oral history team on this piece of research. And one of the really pleasant, I love doing the oral history, but one of the really pleasant things about it is that sometimes um, I get given things for the trustees, clearly. And I've never forgotten interviewing Steve Williams, who's sitting on the front row here, whose father was the policeman up, uh, in Coggeshall uh, just after the war or, or during and after the war. And Steve did this long interview with me about the problems that his father had with the people squatting in the Nissen huts and a, a certain amount of thievery going on in the big house while it was still standing. And all the time I was doing this interview, his wife, Cynthia, sat in the room and didn't say a word. And just as I was leaving the house, she said, just a minute, I've got something to show you. And she came back. with this wonderful object. Can you stand up, Cynthia, and then everybody can see you? <laughs> Shall I hold it or will you hold it? Why don't you hold it, but just don't drop it? Now, Cynthia explained to me that her grandparents had farmed at Purley Farm, which is on the Earl's Cone Road. It's the place where the Montessori School is now, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And this had been flattened, literally flattened, by a doodle bug in the Second World War. And out of the terrible ruins, and I can show you a picture of that if anyone's interested, staggered three people alive, one of them clutching this teapot. And I just thought that was such a wonderful story. And I begged her, didn't I, Cynthia? I begged her, please, will you, at some point, give this to the trustees? Because I could just imagine it being uh, a wonderful um, exhibit. Uh, and I just couldn't bear the thought of it going on a skip at some point in the future because nobody knew its history. So Cynthia has very kindly given this today to the trustees. And on behalf of the trustees, I'd like to thank you very much for that. And we will be... <laughs> And she says she hopes it stays intact. But we will do what, I promise we will do whatever we can to keep it intact for a time immemorial. We've also been given furniture, a mirror, photographs. And what part of my uh, intention today is to ask any of you who might know anybody who has artifacts or photographs connected to the house, please. They will be in very good hands here and enjoyed by visitors to come. Okay, are we ready, Edward? Brilliant. Okay, so my brief today is to tell you something about the oral history project here. Because we're such a kind of, it seems rude if I say you're a mixed bag audience. I, I don't mean that, but you're not, you know, I, I'm trying to give a presentation this morning which will be entertaining and also which some of you may be able to interrupt and add to our knowledge of the estate. It would be really lovely if we could do a bit of oral history on the hoof. But if you're kind of nervous about doing this, that doesn't matter either because you can come up and see me afterwards and your, your name and address will be logged for future reference. Um, so I'm going to start by saying something general about oral history just so that we all get up to speed. And then I intend to ask some questions to which I don't know the answers. I'm going to show you uh, slides on the uh, overhead, which will, I hope, be memory lane for some of you. And if any of you know the answer to these questions I, or would like to debate them with me, I'd be very glad to do that, as I say. So let's start by thinking about um, oral history 
uh, as a science, if you like. Obviously, on the one hand, oral history is a very special kind of history because it deals with living memory. But on the other hand, it's subject to the laws of evidence, just as document-based uh, history must be. Um, with a written history document, such as some of the maps, for instance, that James has shown already, we need to consider who prepared this document. What were the instructions they were given? What were the constraints that they prepared this document under? What might be concealed or glossed or uh, wrongly asserted in this document? We historians have to think about this very carefully. So a map, for instance, um, records what the map maker was told to record and it's recorded in the style that he was requested to pr uh, prepare it in. The per someone's paying to have the map drawn up, and they want what they're paying for, clearly. So what I'm trying to say is, the map is not an aerial photograph. Uh, what it records has always been carefully selected. So we, as historians, have to work out what's been deliberately left off because it was irrelevant to the purpose of the map. Stuff is still left off ordnance survey maps for various reasons, for instance. The same is true of oral history, um, which is a spoken and recorded communication rather than a written one. And Lynn Abrams, who's one of the oral history gurus, says, and this is a quote from one of her books, we have to consider not just what is said, but also how it's said, why it's said, and what it means. So on top of that, then there's the whole memory issue. Isn't memory subjective? Isn't it fallible? Well, yes, I can tell you it certainly is. Isn't it selective? Of course it is. Um, memory is not like an album of photographs that kind of fade gently uh, in time. It's as James has just said, it's more like a narrative, a story which gets revised over time in the head of the person whose memory it is. So the respondent tells the truth as he sees it. He constructs this story based on his own interpretation. He selects uh, and arranges his material for his own benefit, uh, and it's therefore rich in meaning. The interviewer, that's me, uh, listens and accepts and transcribes very carefully exactly what's been said, but also, and this is the sneaky bit, I cross-check within the interview, so I ask supplementary questions just to check I've understood it, and I also cross-check between interviews. And what emerges from this process can, be, uh, um, can add a very special understanding to the paper evidence of history, and that's exactly what I want to explore with you today. And I'd just like to say before I get on to explore that I'm really grateful to everybody who has agreed to be interviewed for this project. Some of them have been interviewed more than once, um, and some of them have agreed to come today. Um, and I thought, as I've said, it might be fun to raise some questions that have puzzled me uh, about Mark's Hall and invite a little oral history from the floor. Um, but before I do that, I'd like to say something briefly about what oral history has added to the project so far. The project began in 2010 with the aim of finding ways to enhance the visitor experience at Marks Hall, clearly with the idea of increasing visitor numbers. And we sat down and considered the estate's long history, some of which James has already uh, mentioned, um, and we decided that the demolition story uh, would be a good place to start. Because it's a very complex story involving an estate brought low by war, a childless widow, an impoverished post-war nation, and a whole collection of local, legal, and cultural difficulties that in combination, as James has said, saw the end of many fine historic homes in Essex in the 1950s, not just Mark's Hall. And we felt that if we told this story, it might send visitors home satisfied and with a lot to think about. And we were anxious to discover what, if anything, oral history could add to our knowledge and the ways in which we might present this demolition story. Um, I'm not going to say any more about this now, but I'm very happy to answer questions. And we do have, I think, a panel dis uh, discussion this afternoon. So you can certainly come and ask me questions uh, about the, the general uh, project. So just to tell you how the interviews were done, 
Uh, we did six interviews in the autumn of 2010. This was just a, a pilot to see if, if what we suspected would happen. And since then, we've conducted a, a further 26 interviews involving nearly 30 individuals uh, who all had memories of living or working on the estate in the 20th century. So altogether, I've got 60 hours or more uh, of these recordings, um, and I've spent, of course, a good deal more than 60 hours transcribing them. And the interviews have contributed answers to questions, but they've also opened up um, some new lines of inquiry, and that's very exciting when that happens. They have verified, but they've also failed to verify some of the ideas that, um, that we had, and they've produced, as we've already said, contributions which will go into the archive, photographs and artifacts. We selected our interviewees in a number of ways. Um, some were names suggested by trustees, uh, employees and volunteers at Marks Hall. Others have come from previous interview uh, interviewees and personal contacts. You just have to go into the local newspaper uh, for just a little photograph and your phone lines are ringing for days afterwards. Um, one of the personal contacts is a man in the audience today called Dennis Abraham who's a long-term resident and networker in Coggeshall. I think his primary interest, it would be true to say, is the military history of um, the airfield, but he's been responsible for setting up quite a lot of the interviews, and he sat in on them and contributed to them. And I'm really grateful to you, Dennis, for doing that. Some of the interviews were one-to-one. -one. Some took place in a group. Two were recorded as we walked around the estate. Um, so far, every single interview, and I'm not exaggerating here, has added to our knowledge in some way. So we haven't finished yet. We haven't any, anywhere near come to the end of this. Um, many of them complement each other. Um, some of the claims are verifiable in interesting ways. And I'm just going to give you two examples of this, but I could give you many more. For instance, two of my interviewees, both of whom were local farmers on the estate, when I asked them why they thought the house had been demolished, they observed that it had, they thought it had suffered from subsidence on the southwestern corner of the mansion. That's the corner where the bay tree is. Um, Tim Dennis, who's also in the audience today, organized the geophysical survey before the archaeologists moved in. He had a close look at some very high quality photographs of the front of the mansion house taken in the 1920s. And he, he looked with a, a magnifying glass at the brickwork. And he said to me, I think this house had subsidence on this end of the house. Um, and I was able to say to him, well, you're in agreement with two of my interviewees then, which is always very pleasant. Another example, I was told by the Marks Hall agent, a man called Mr. Graham, who lives in Newport in South Wales, who worked for the estate until the trustees took over after the death of Mrs. Price in, the 19, in 1966. Mr. Graham told me that a girls' school had been evacuated to Marks Hall in 1940. And this was actually confirmed by an interview. I'm not sure if he's in the audience today. He was certainly invited. Um, who'd actually seen these girls at work on, at their desks in the main hall in Marks Hall when he was a little boy uh, coming in with his father. Um, he thought, though, that they were Dr. Bernardo children. So it should be quite easy for me to verify this at some point when I get in touch with the Dr. Bernardo archive. So through oral history, we're building up a three-dimensional picture uh, from the memories of people who uh, connected in different ways to the estate. Um, some worked the land. Some were employed on the airfield, some lived in Nissen huts after the war, um, some were local children who saw the estate as their territory. And although many interviews ended with general conversation, they all cover the following uh, general areas which are vital to the project. Next slide, please. So it's the individual's connection to Marks Hall, uh, their memories of people who worked on the estate or for the prices, their memories of the mansion house, both inside and out. Next slide. Uh, memories of the sale of the fabric and the demolition of the house. We've managed to find some of those. Any theory as to why the house might have been demolished? Who cut down the ancient oaks in the deer park? When and why? Next slide. Um, memories and impressions of Mrs. Price. I've got a wonderful uh, combination of those. Um, and recommendations, of course, for uh, future interviewees. However, when I read through the transcribed interviews, as of course I've done many times, I discover that they're much more than just a discussion of these topics. This is one of the factors, of course, that makes oral history so rich. 
For instance, the old Deer Park landscape of Marks Hall, which completely disappeared between 1942 uh, when the deer left and the fence came down, um, and the mid-1950s when the oaks were felled and the Forestry Commission moved in. It's not just a setting in the oral history accounts, it's actually a player in many of the stories. The memories are enacted in this disappeared landscape. The place itself is meaningful, irrespective of what happened on particular days. Children and working men understood and appreciated the landscape in particular ways, and this memory affected how they told their story to me. I too was a country child who played and supervised among hedgerows in woodland, streams and ponds, who observed the natural life of the woods and the fields. So I particularly enjoy this aspect of the interviews, and I've decided to concentrate on this today. I want to raise some aspect of the Marks Hall landscape which puzzle me and to which I don't yet have uh, a satisfactory answer. And I hope as I raise these questions, you will feel free to interrupt me and add any ideas or knowledge you may have. And if you're too shy to do that, then please come up and see me later. Um, so I'm going to start with the, what I call the Northern Avenue. Uh, can I have the next slide? This is the 1764 estate plan. I need my little pointer here. So let's begin with a notion of Mark's Hall as a Jacobean mansion with its large wall garden and lakes, three in this, in this early plan, uh, at the heart of a long established deer park. This is not just any old house. It's also a statement of local wealth and power. It's an employer of labor, and a provider of farms to lease. The family who live there, there's the house at the bottom there, um, see themselves as local squires, doing what they can to stimulate and support local agriculture and cultural events. Mark saw is also a private family's home for their private use uh, and their invited guests over many generations. I'm sure you all know the Honeywoods were here from early 17th century right through to the end of the 19th. We know that Robert Honeywood bought the estate in 1605 with, it, with its deer park uh, and proceeded to build the mansion house which uh, James has shown us pictures of and which was demolished in 1950. He built it either on top of or in front of an existing house. And we'll discuss that when we go up to look at the archaeology at lunchtime. One of his descendants decided, we think, to lay out the pleasure garden within the deer park um, although the house, of course, is outside the deer park. Uh, and he also decided to close up a public road which ran to, along here to the west of the deer park. So this plan of 1764 clearly shows the wall gardens and the lakes. Um, and the mansion itself is added to in the 18th century. Um, I'll perhaps say a bit more about that in a moment. Um, I think some alteration was made to the servant's wing and uh, a dining room was added at the back of the house. This plan of uh, 1764 also, of course, shows the deer park with its paling fence, very neatly hatched in, um, and two planted features, the long oak avenue and a line of trees planted inside the park as it abuts Little Church Field here. The oaks in the deer park are also shown, growing close together in the northeastern corner, uh, but the rest of the park apparently more open. This map actually gives you the impression that if you'd stood by the wall garden and looked north, you would have had a more or less unobstructed view to Thrift Lane on the northern boundary. But remember what I said about maps. We don't know that this map maker was instructed to put in every single oak where it actually grew, and I'm sure he wasn't, in fact. The 1898 Ordnance Survey map, which I'll show you in a moment, um, doesn't give this distribution pattern at all. Um, so this is not an aerial photograph. It's a very smart plan that the person paying for it wanted a smart illustration. Now, there are several things about this 18th century estate improvement which puzzle me and I, which I hope you may be able to help me solve. The first thing that puzzles me is the route in. As I said, mansions like Mark's Hall were making a statement of power, and this statement usually involved a grand entrance. 
Now Essex, as I'm sure, even though James has just shown us a, a map of um, all the uh, wonderful houses in Essex that were pulled down, in fact, Essex didn't have any really grand houses. Uh, but it wasn't, nevertheless, it wasn't devoid of lodge gates, uh, serpentine drives, and, uh, and the impedimentia of the grand entrance. So where was Marks Hall's entrance? This 18th century plan of the estate suggests very strongly that the house was meant to be approached from the north, down the long, off Thrift Lane here, down the long Oak Avenue to the house. Visitors, therefore, would have turned off the main road at Hop Green Farm into Thrift Wood, meeting the park paling. Uh, where's my th Here. That's where the park paling would be, on that corner there. Um, just before they get to the gate in the avenue to, to send them down the, the road there, um, where they turn south to approach the house. They could also have approached this same gate from this end, coming down Long Chase and along Thrift Lane that way. Thrift Lane's a public road, um, but the avenue through the Deer Park is private. Um, and despite farms called Gatehouse and Lodge Farm, Marksall seems not to have had anything like a lodge house, which would, of course, have made the statement of uh, the main entrance to a grand house some way off and which would also have controlled access, clearly. The same 1764 map shows no sign of a drive coming in from the south past Borchiers and Marigolds. It shows a dead end here, probably gated, within sight of the mansion and the church, um, and a field to be crossed. There's no expensive avenue, this end, um, and no lodge cottage. We know that another public, the public road I've already mentioned, would have turned left at this point, down the hill, over the iron bridge out here, and then would have petered out after the 1740s when the road was closed, would have petered out into public footpaths here, not a road, but footpaths. Um, so what about this avenue? The Honeywoods may just have wanted an avenue. It's possible that they could have ridden in and walked in. Um, it may have been no more than an expensive addition to their pleasure grounds like the wall garden and the lakes uh, had been. Um, if we accept that the Northern Avenue is a route in for visitors, this still gives me a problem because once, off, when, once into the park off Thrift Lane, uh, you're in private property. Can you, next slide please. Um, you trot down this beautiful avenue right through the park. And when you arrive at the first lake, uh, the track forks, according to the 1842 tithe map, um, the track proper lying to the north of the avenue. I, I think I've got it on a, on a slide. Yes, this is the 1842 tithe map. Here's the avenue coming down from Thrift Lane. That's marked brown, like a track on the, t on the map. You can't see it very clearly here. When you get to this point here, the brown track comes outside the avenue, as if it's suggesting that wheeled vehicles should go that way. But whether you come down, down this track or in the middle of the avenue, you come to the southern end of the avenue, presumably through a gate in the park paling near the house end of the lake. So you've arrived. What meets your eye? Is it a splendid and impressive mansion? Let's have the next slide, please. No, it's the back wall of some outbuildings, and this has been considerably smartened up in living memory because um, that's the back wall of the current estate office. Uh, in the Honeywood time, and in fact in, in the uh, Price's time, there was another range of buildings behind this. Uh, next slide. Possibly the old crumbling dovecot, which of course is no longer there. Um, we've, the carpenter shop is not far from here. You've got the coach house, the barn, uh, and the um, stables. So maybe in your smart coach visiting this house, you buzz quickly past this, uh, past the tradesman's entrance to the house, which is the entrance into the uh, stable, into, into the coach house yard and the kitchen yard. Um, you're probably averting your eyes from manure heaps and lines of washing. Um, you take a sharp right turn at the church, um, and that's your first sight of the mansion. But again, what do you actually see?
Are you looking at the, 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 the front entrance with its triple-decker porch? No, you're not. This doesn't seem to me to be an approach uh, designed to impress. You're looking at a rather disappointing side view of the mansion. Um, but it might explain the addition of this front door here, a sort of extra front door here, which is there in the um, 1833 uh, uh, illustration and the 1902 Country Life pictures, but it's not there in the 1923 uh, slide, which I think James showed us, which prevents the servants having their dinner in the uh, uh, hall behind that from looking out at whoever is arriving in their smart coach. That was also something that Mr. Price got rid of, uh, not in the 1923 image. But nevertheless, I think this is quite a disappointing approach to the house. So maybe the Honeywoods were relying on the deer park to provide the wow factor, and they didn't bother too much about whether you saw the front of the house when you came in. We know, as James has said, that the protecting the trees in the park became a bankrupting millstone for the Honeywoods, um, and that the last private owner, Mr. Price, was so convinced of the unique beauty and value of this deer park that he gave it to the nation. But I think there really should have been a lodge at the top of the Northern Avenue um, because it was a very tempting shortcut for people, lazy people who were walking from uh, Halstead to Coggeshaw, um, and they didn't fancy going all the way over to the, the B Road and down that way. In 1872, for instance, Mrs. Honeywood, who was a widow, encountered a very alarming stranger in this Northern Avenue. He was a licensed hawker from Halstead who was just too lazy to take the, the public road. And when she stopped him, he insisted on his right as a licensed hawker to come down the avenue and knock on the kitchen door and try and sell his ware though. But we know from this story, because he was, he was um, taken up for trespassing, uh, it's said in the, in the newspaper account of this, in, of this encounter that there were notices to trespassers affixed at each end of that Northern Avenue. Um, one of these notices would have been on Thrift Lane, clearly. What about the other one? Where would the other one have been? Was it on the Deer, uh, park, the deer Fence, the Deer Park Fence, uh, just behind the coach house? Or did they have it near the church so that people who came to look at the church weren't tempted to have a little exploration into the private part uh, of the estate? Was there a gate there preventing people from going from the church into the private part of the estate? I would guess there probably was. So that was, that's my question about the northern approach. I don't know if anyone wants to put in their two penny worth. Have you ever thought about this? What's the function of that avenue? OK. Well, let's think about the southern approach then. Next slide, please, Edward. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, quick one. The, the Honeywoods were close to the Harlequinlands at Coke Priory in Old Stone. Right. So that's a very, you know, they likely wouldn't have gone around the south to get to Old Stone. OK. So Tim Dennis here at the front suggests, and I, I have to think about this, that this may have been set up by the Honeywood, the early Honeywoods, as a kind of their route to the Harlackendons at Earl's Cone, who were the most important family locally. I need to think about that, yes. I need also to go back to Ralph Jocelyn's diary. Who, presumably when Ralph Jocelyn came to call at Mark's Hall, he would have come down the avenue. I need to go and just check it out and see if he mentions it. And of course, in those days, it would have been rather a paltry avenue because the trees would have been rather small. <laughs> That's another thing to think about. OK, let's think then about the southern approach. You all recognize this because this is the way we come in now. Um, at some point, it was decided to improve this approach by making the road past marigolds more formal. Um, but still, this route past Borchiers and marigolds also has some peculiarities as far as I'm concerned. We saw, I showed you in the 1864 map, the lane just petering out where the track down to the Iron Bridge turns off. Next slide, please. At that point, sorry, that's not a very good photograph. Um, presumably, at this point, uh, not going down to the hill but going straight on, you had a footpath and a bridleway making for the church, and you just had to make your way through the mud if it was, if it was that part of the uh, of time of the year. Um, the track to the left, this one I'm showing in the slide, leads down the hill and over the brook on the Iron Bridge out here. And then, it, as I said, it peters out into footpaths uh, after the middle of the 18th century. Um, I think that this route, uh, the southern route into Marksall, was probably smartened up in the 19th century. Maps, if you look at the Ordnance Survey maps, 
they show that this approach doesn't acquire its avenue uh, until uh, the middle of the 18th century, of the 19th century. They are clearly shown, uh, next slide please, on the 1898 Ordnance Survey map. Here's marigolds here at the bottom, here's the route in, uh, and there the trees begin. That's where the previous photograph was going down to the Iron Bridge, and there shows a proper track, a proper track in to Marks Hall here. Um, Mrs. Honeywood took some boys to court in the 1870s for damaging some young chestnut trees in this avenue, snapping their trunks, that's what the house describes, which does suggest they're quite young trees then. Um, and at some point between the 1864 map I showed you and the first edition of the Ordnance Survey 6-inch map, which is dated 1875, um, the deer park is perhaps extended a bit south, all of this grey hatching on the Ordnance Survey map. I'm not sure if it's meant to suggest that it's all deer park or whether it's just something that the uh, Honeywoods took in hand at that point. But it seems to me, as I say, that the, the, this route, the southern route to the mansion, was um, enhanced in the 19th century. It's obviously the um, route in as used by the prices, and it's certainly the route in as used by many of my interviewees. Um, and this approach, unlike the avenue that comes down off Thrift Lane, would have provided a splendid view, next slide please, of the mansion house for more or less that view. It's, I, I haven't quite got the right angle, but... Some, nobody took the right photograph for me. So those are my puzzles. Now, oral history has added something to these conundrums. Um, and I'm going to quote some of my oral history uh, interviewees now. Some of them suggested that the view of the house from the south, this one here, stopped them in their tracks for a variety of reasons. Revel Stiles, for instance, used to visit his father. And by the way, I've got permission to quote these people because they all signed a consent form before they even opened their mouths. Um, so uh, not that they're going to say anything scurrilous, but you never know. Revel Stiles used to visit his father who worked on the airfield during the war. He'd come up this avenue that I've just described, the, the one from Marigolds, and he, this is what he said. Mark's Hall was always the big house ahead of you as you came to the forked road. And there, sitting there, was this red-bricked, beautiful house. He didn't say whether he turned down left towards the bridge or right towards the churchyard on his visits, but he, there's no doubt in his interview that he clearly appreciated the presence of this house in the landscape. Owen Martin, who's here this morning and who worked on the estate uh, after the war, remembered the girls who worked in the house for Mrs. Price uh, before the war and who went courting with Coggershaw boys. Um, I don't think Owen was one of these lads, but this is what he said. They were only allowed to go to the oak tree where you turn down to go down the big hill to the bridge. They were only allowed to go so far when they were going out together. They had to walk the rest of the way on their own. I can never pass this oak tree now without thinking of the parade of servant girls uh, going home while the lad lounges under the oak tree kind of waving or blowing kisses or whatever Cockershaw boys did in those days. Notice the railings in this picture and also the gate. I'm going to come and talk about gates in a moment. This interesting array of gates, I don't know the history of this gate, but just keep it in mind, and also the railings, because I'm going to be talking about those in a second. Um, Dennis Woods also had a, a memory from this spot. He said, before the war, you, when you went up there, you go along the lane, there was high railings on each side when you first come on the estate. But in my mother's time, he said, there was no railings there, and they've taken them away again now. But you go up there, you turn straight onto the church and house and turn left down to the Iron Bridge. So he's absolutely on this spot here. But they'd send the dogs after us from the house, from Mark's Hall. You'd get that mostly every weekend. Now, as soon as he said that to me, I had this kind of impression of three lusty Alsatians. Um, however, next slide, please. <laughs> <laughs> So it wasn't that Mrs. Price's dogs were big and fierce. They clearly weren't. Um, 
This was no more than a signal sent from the house that the boy's presence wasn't welcome so near to the house, even though they're on a public right of way. And the previous owner, Mrs. Honeywood, in the previous century, had terrorized the neighborhood, and I'm not, that, that is the word to use, with a pair of Pyrenean wolfhounds. And I didn't bring a slide of them, because you can look them up for yourself, but they are terrifying looking dogs. Uh, I'll say a bit more about them in a moment. Maisie Smith, who I think is here this morning, a farmer's daughter at Heron's Farm, remembered as a 13-year-old sitting on the railings I showed you just now uh, near the church. Next slide, please. Yes, sitting on those railings. And she said, but when we used to go sometimes in the evenings, we used to go over to walk along Church Meadow, uh, that's to the uh, right of the road here, um, and climb on the rails and watch ladies coming to part parties in their party dresses. They mostly came in carriages. So these visitors are clearly coming on the route past Marigolds. And there's evidently something special about this spot because Pat Haynes said, um, you could never get near Mark's Hall House as a child because it was, in a, it was in a deer park and the deer park had a fence around it. This was always a bit mysterious to me. That word mysterious is brilliant. Um, it just completely conjures up this lost landscape. So these snippets of information from oral history express a great deal about the presence of the house in the landscape and the power of the estate to attract people, including children, and also to deter them. Um, the power of the family to attract attention, but also to police those people that it attracted. So this was the point, this, this was the point at which uninvited visitors or, or people made the decision to either proceed boldly down to the house or to turn aside at a safish distance uh, down to the old iron bridge. And although all, all of this ended when Mrs. Price sold her furniture and moved to Marigolds in 1942, and when the electricity board erected its giant pylons, uh, nevertheless, this spot still held its power for me at least, into the um, 1980s. So having thought about the approaches to the house, I now want to think about the Deer Park. Those of us who came to Mark's Hall after 1960, and I'm one of them, entered a landscape, initially Forestry Commission territory, but actually, of course, it was much more than this. In the 1970s, uh, it felt like a wilderness, uh, that was under the partial control of men who set snares and culled deer. Dan Sansom, another of my interviewees, who sadly died since he gave me his interview, said, I used to go there quite a lot in the old days, late 50s onwards, because it rapidly became a jungle. My wife and I, when the boys were young, we used to go up and wander around. It was rather nice, actually. And as soon as he said that, he's not wrong. It was very nice when it was a jungle. I'm not saying it isn't beautiful now, trustees who spent a lot of money on it, but it was actually very nice as a jungle. You could, you could literally get lost there. I did several times. Um, Dan Sansom describes skating on the lakes, uh, pushing his way onto the ice through banks that were hopelessly overgrown. That was his word. I think in the 1970s, some of you may disagree with me, in which case please do, but I think in the 1970s there was no indication that this had once been a deer park. I completely failed to sense this kind of ancient landscape, even though as a child I'd spent hours and hours playing in ancient parkland in Herefordshire, which is where I grew up. I didn't ask my interviewees specific questions about the park, and yet when I came back to read uh, what they'd said, um, to see if they'd actually mentioned it, it was there in almost every interview, supporting and intruding into the memories of other subjects. And this is why I want to discuss this element in the oral history project in an attempt to show what a powerful methodology it is. So talking about the deer park, let's start with the fence. Every deer park has a fence, clearly. Uh, it's to keep the deer in so that they don't roam over local fields because that gets the estate into bad odor with the tenant farmers um, who are annoyed by deer nibbling things they shouldn't. And of course, it's uh, a keep out uh, territorial thing for people who might want to go in there and steal firewood or whatever, or deer. And typically, because deer parks are clearly a, um, um, 
part of our history. Um, typically, these deer park boundaries involve earthworks and ditches, palings and walls. And because deer are quite athletic, um, the wall, the, 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 whatever fence you have uh, to keep the deer in, it's going to be an obtrusive element in the landscape. You're going to be able to see it. It's got to be tall. So this gave some landscape improvers in the 18th century who'd been told to improve a deer park so that uh, in, in keeping with the ideas of Capability Brown and, and other famous landscape uh, architects, it meant that when they tried to improve a deer park, uh, they had to do something about this obtrusive fence. Um, I'm thinking now, I've seen this done in, um, can you just try the next slide? I think I've got a picture of it. Yes. This is a photograph of a, of a very lovely deer park in Herefordshire called Mockers Park, um, which is what Mark's Hall might have looked like uh, had we not lost the oaks. Mockers Park was improved in the 18th century, and one bit of the, a, a large ex extent of the fence was sunk into a ditch, as you can see here. Is that sort of fairly plain? So that the road coming along here is the same level as the top of the ditch here, and you've got this they've gone to the trouble of sinking a, a, a deep ditch and putting the, the fence at the bottom of it. So if you stand on the road, you're not conscious of the fence. It's as if you can see straight into the park and there's nothing stopping you. Um, uh, there's nothing stopping your vision. Um, perhaps because Mark's Hall House was outside the park, uh, the fence doesn't seem to have been modified in this way. Um, but some of you may have ideas on this. Um, instead, it seems at Mark's Hall, they modified the gardens within the park uh, and they created an internal fence around the gardens so that the deer couldn't come in and nibble the roses. Um, I haven't yet found any indication that the fence at Mark's Hall was sunk anywhere along its length. But having said that, I'm very unsure of the route that the fence took behind the house from the end of the Northern Avenue down to Robins Brook. An etching which James has already shown us, and we can have a look at it again. Um, being a bit cleaned up, James, I'll show you how to do this. <laughs> You're not looking through jelly at this one. Um, this etching is dated 1833, and it shows, if you look, a neat little fence behind the house, presumably running down to Robin's Brook. Um, but would this have been a barrier for deer? I'm not sure. Maybe there was a whacking great ditch the other side of it. Um, the 1842 tithe map, which I've already shown you, this is another bit of it. The Northern Avenue coming down here, with as I've showed you the track on the outside of it. And before I've gone about the fence, all these buildings here have been removed uh, at some point, maybe the trustees or, or some other point. But um, here's the Deer Park fence going down in a dead straight line. It looks very far away from where that etching was taken. I'm not sure if you would have actually seen it from there. So, but there's no fence put here. Maybe the etching got it wrong. I don't know. Maybe it had been removed. So this tithe map suggests that the deer fence ran in this dead straight line from the outbuildings at the back of the coach house. That's the coach house. So that's the extra buildings that have been knocked down that I told you about earlier. I think that's the dovecot or possibly that one. Um, and there's a gate here allowing access to the gardens. Um, I'm not sure whether these, as I said, were one and the same fence. Um, the fence was always in need of repair. Herbie Smith, who's in the audience today, remembered it was Carpenter Smith's job to check for breaches in the fence and to mend them. He said the whole deer park had a wooden fence right the way round it. I think it must have been about three miles in extent because Wivenhoe Park, which is slightly smaller um, in acreage uh, in comparison with Marks Hall, had a fence just less than three miles. Do we know who put it there in the first place? Do we know? Who put it there in the first place? That's a lovely question. Do we, anybody here know who put it there in the first place? I had this kind of fantasy, well, it's not a fantasy, that this fence has been there since the park was laid down. 
and it's been the loving work of every carpenter on the estate to put an extra bit of wood in. And I could imagine a man with a, with a knowledge of his, of his trade, such as the estate carpenters would have had, kind of noting how the previous chap botched this bit, or this bit's never been too good because there's always a damp patch underneath it, and this bit rots quicker than anything else. There's a kind of, I'm sure there's a technological understanding of how this fence worked, which we've completely lost. Uh, and there was at least one fenced off enclosure within the park where the deer were driven for culling. This is Buck's Piece on the, uh, it's kind of up here on the avenue. Um, uh, next slide, please, Edward. This is the only picture I've yet found no, uh, of the deer park uh, uh, fence. Um, Stan Haynes, one of my interviewees, remembered, when I was a boy, the, t the fencing was timber sliced to make a wall post and rail fence around it. Aubrey Botting and Cecil Blackwell called it a paling fence and a pale fence. Um, Dennis Woods remembered his watching his grandfather help Carpenter Smith. He said one held the plank, that was the word he used, while the other one nailed it. Um, notice the gate arrangements here. I think they're probably demountable gates, the sort of thing that you can put aside if somebody wants to walk through or you want to get timber out. Uh, but they don't look like proper gates to me. I don't know. They've obviously been had bits added to stop the deer jumping over. And I remain puzzled by one account of the fencing at Marks Hall. Uh, Roger Browning, a farmer at Great Tay, remembered going along the hop green track uh, to Thrift Lane as a child before the war. And he said, and there were high hedges along there, natural hedges like we get these days, but they were reinforced with boards, cut out of trunks, roughly cut, I suppose. I remember these hedges being reinforced with planks, perhaps eight or nine inches wide and eight foot high. Part of the hedge from hop green round towards the big house. That is an absolute recipe for firewood, isn't it? I mean, what a wonderful fire you could get from just pinching one of these planks out of the hedge. But this is the, the Roger Browning's account is the first one I've heard of a hedge plus a, deer, uh, plus a fence going around a deer park. I've done a lot of research on this, and I can't quite picture it. Why would you need two barriers? Um, was Mr. Browning perhaps remembering a line of tree trunks rather than a hedge with the uh, uh, planks uh, connecting them? These fences need constant upkeep um, as the deer escape whenever they can and have to be returned to the um, park. And in order to do this, the park paling has a special, specially constructed um, piece called a deer leap. Next photo, please. Um, this is what it looks like at Mockers Park. It's been very carefully restored, no doubt with an English Heritage Grant. It's that little bit of wall right there, which has got a bit of fence above it, but you could take the fence down and the deer are driven through it. Um, in Marks Hall, the deer leaps on the edge of Buck's Piece. It's marked, clearly marked on the Ordnance Survey map. Um, so the deer that were returned into the park were returned into Buck's Piece. And it must have had a fence arrangement with a drop on the deer park side to prevent the park from, uh, uh, deer from jumping back out. Next slide, please. It probably looked like this one, which is uh, from Wolsey Park in Staffordshire. Next one. Here's a picture of it in action. Um, Francis Kilvert, the diarist, wrote in January 1878, next um, slide, about a visit that he made to mock us. We went through the deer park among the great ruined, weird, ghostly oaks. Coming back, we saw some deer that had broken bounds outside the park pales. Priests said that they kept hounds at mock us for hunting the stray deer back into the park and that the deer would be driven in again over the, the buck leap. So that's how it was done at mock us. Maybe it was done um, this way here at Marks Hall. Um, when coppicing was carried out in neighboring woodland, fencing was especially important uh, to prevent deer from eating the young shoots of the coppice trees. There's a record in the Essex Record Office of a lease drawn up in 1624 for a portion of Hatfield Forest that specified that the deer were to be kept out for six years following coppicing, and only then were deer leaps to be installed, and this is a quote, for the deer only to leap in and out, and for no other cattle whatsoever. And the said deer leaps to continue so long as the coppices shall continue enclosed. So in Hatfield Forest, the deer were privileged over the tenant farmer's cows, clearly. 
Mark's Hall had a deer leap, which, as I said, which was clearly marked on the Ordnance Survey map on the eastern edge of the park. Next slide, please. This is what it looks like today. I'm sorry it's not a very impressive photograph, but notice there's a, a pool of water there, which suggests that there was a ditch at some point, which would have prevented the deer from leaping back in the other direction. Given that there's a fence around the park, there have to be formal entrances for people on foot or horseback or with vehicles to use. Herbie Smith has told me about double gates where Keeper's Cottage is, which was very useful to him when he was a young gamekeeper, collecting tips from people coming through the gate um, by opening the gate to riders. Where were the other gates through the pet park palings? I've already mentioned gates at both ends of the uh, Oak Avenue, um, and if the park was extended south, uh, as I suggested it may have been, then the gate at Marigolds clearly would have become more significant. And when I was driving Hubby Smith over this morning, we did a bit of oral history quickly in the car. And as we came through the gate at Marigolds into the estate, Hubby said there used to be what he called a kissing gate there, which was a, a kind of pedestrian gate, um, the sort where you have to go around the gate, you have to kind of squeeze through one after the other. Um, what about the footbridge that was used by Dennis Woods' grandfather when he carried his wife's chickens from Crowlands, which is the, it's disappeared now, but it was a farm up on the rise behind the visitor centre here, when he carried his wife's chickens to the mansion kitchen door. Next slide, please. Um, he said, if you go down over the Iron Bridge, he's coming from the Crowlands uh, from this direction, if you go down over the Iron Bridge... Uh, no, sorry, I beg your pardon, he's coming from the other direction. If you go down over the Iron Bridge, you turn right. That's just out here. Um, you get halfway along there, and you'll see a little bridge over. It's a bit further up than the, the new bridge that's just been put in. Well, my grandfather, when he was up at, uh, up at the house, after they took him into Crowlands, his wife looked after the chickens. They'd send a boy up from the house. Mr. Price wants so many chickens, and he'd have to prepare the chickens. But... When he went down, he had the privilege of walking out of that bridge up to the house because not just anybody could go up there. They were funny about those things. Um, so presumably, I'm going to come on about their funny ways in a moment. Presumably, this bridge must have um, involved some kind of a gate. And notice the fence. It's not a paling fence at this point because we're looking at the bridge from the Marks Hall side here and the deer park continues the other side of the um, stream a bit. It's also possible that, um, as I've suggested, temporary gates like hurdles may have been erected from time to time when they were extracting timber, um, as we saw on the earlier slide. What did these gates look like? Were they made of wood or iron? Next slide, please. Here's an example I'm sure you're all familiar with, uh, which is still there near the churchyard. Um, did they include a small side gate for pedestrians? Well, Herbie said yes, some of them did. Um, it's odd to think, or as I think it's odd, that the, the, once the fences came down to accommodate the airfield in 1941, this careful work of centuries was just gone in a, in a day. Um, nevertheless, as those of you who are familiar with the estate know that it's possible to walk right around the circumference of the park, except for the bit I mentioned behind the house, and to see the ditch, the trees, tree stumps, uh, clearly indicating where this fence would have, st would, would have stood. So I'm going to start to wrap this up now. Um, the Mark Saw project is in its early stages. Um, we've got a lot of ideas about how we can use the estate's rich history to engage the visitor. And rather than bemoaning the loss of the mansion and the deer park, we feel that we can present it in such a way that the visitor is encouraged to think about the reasons for why things change and in making judgments, he can experience something of the excitement of historical discovery. That's the big plan anyway. We're relying on the Colchester Archaeology Group um, to help us literally see the foundations of the mansion, and we're going to go up in a moment and have a look at them. We're, looking, we're going to be looking at its drains, its rubbish pits, and its water supply, um, the secrets of its renovation, which are nowhere recorded on paper. And this is similar to what we're doing with oral history. Uh, we're relying on oral history and the memories and thoughts of local people whose families worked on the estate uh, and for the family living at uh, Marks Hall uh, or who were involved in the wartime airfield. Unlike formal photographs and documents, these oral history memories in combination, I think, capture a three-dimensional view.
And because the memories are filtered through an individual's experience and through generations in some case, Dennis Woods was talking about his grandparents, they, they create not just a static narrative of events, but also a fertile account of sights, feelings, impressions, connections, and personalities. And like the archaeological discoveries, the oral history interviews open up new lines of inquiry and new questions to be addressed. And in addition, as we've seen, some of them produce artifacts, photographs, furniture, and the teapot. Next slide. Which will also, of course, add to the visitor experience at Marks Hall. In a way, oral history also redresses, to some extent, the social balance. For instance, if you look at items about Marks Hall in the local newspaper of the 19th century, what do you find? Is it positive or negative? Well, the first thing you notice is that the long-established Honeywood family is failing. The men are dying childless in their prime, and a childless Honeywood widow enjoyed possession of Marks Hall for 40 years, um, rather as Mrs. Price did for 30 years in the following century. So one could argue that the failure of the house begins much earlier than Mrs. Price being left a widow. It maybe began in the 1850s when Mrs. Honeywood was left a widow. They do their bit, uh, this is thinking about how they're reported in the local newspapers, they do their bit in the locality, they support local agricultural societies with exhibits and prizes and appearances. Um, they support local liberal politics, or at least the Honeywoods do, with funding and appearances and dinners. They support sporting events by hunting. Uh, there's some wonderful hunting stories in the, in the press. They play cricket not very effectively. Um, and they steward the races at, at Chelmsford. They support the church, um, fundraising, uh, rebuilding various churches. Uh, and, of course, they do fundraising for good causes. They subscribe to the poor. Um, and so on, and they support the law, clearly. Uh, William uh, Philip Honeywood is High Sheriff for the county in 1850, and he's a Crown Court juryman in 1846. And as he himself said in an after-dinner speech in 1846, this is a quote, it would always be his desire and his study to reside on his own estate, to do all the good he could amongst them, to benefit his poorer neighbours, in any way he could. Well, yes, he would say that, wouldn't he? This benefit had to be firmly under his control. He wasn't just scattering his pennies. From 1854, the newspaper begins a series of, um, uh, begins to report a series of depredations on the estate, which the Honeywoods decided needed to be dealt with in court. These crimes, if that's what they were, involved theft of firewood, of rabbits, game, willful damage to trees, fences, glass and woodwork at the mansion. You pick through windows, in other words. The threatening behavior of the trespassing hawker in the avenue, which I mentioned earlier, and various attempts to injure these rapacious wolfhounds uh, who were credited with attacking 14 people. Mrs. Honeywood, get this, Mrs. Honeywood was reported in the paper to have said she didn't mind paying five pounds a bite. <laughs> Which I guess probably, <laughs> you couldn't make it up, could you? Which I suppose might explain some of the provocation of the poor Coggershaw boys who came up with their stones. Um, in addition, Mrs. Honeywood had a tenant family evicted in 1868. They'd enjoyed rent-free uh, possession of a cottage in Thriftwood for 51 years. But they found themselves, and this is a quote from the paper, outside in the rain all night with their furniture after the bailiffs had taken rather rough possession. These cases, and there were many of them, all taking place within Mrs. Honeywood's first 20 years of widowhood, indicate a good deal of tension, I think, between the big house and its community. And some of the tension was voiced in, a, in public uh, at a meeting in Coggershall in 1861, which was called to decide what to do Uh, about the great distress of those working men who, with their families, are now out of employ. One of the speakers at this meeting dared to criticize Mrs. Honeywood. He said, it has been said that Mrs. Honeywood had given 10 pounds to these poor starving people, but that amount was comparatively nothing when it's considered that the poor laborers upon her farms are supported by this parish when in distress. <laughs> 
So the 19th century newspaper suggests quite a strong current, uh, a local current of disaffection with the estate. And this attitude has been picked up in some of the oral history interviews I've done. And I'm going to end by just quoting one of them, uh, Dennis Woods again. He, he does it very neatly. Uh, he says, all my life, I've always heard about Mark's Hall from my mother. She used to go to the church up there. Mr. Price used to send his horse and cart down to pick her up and to take her to church. And then she'd go back to the rectory and have tea. And then they used to take her home. So that's the Lady Bountiful bit. But he continues. You know how it was in those days. If you weren't seen at the church service, you could lose your job. You had to be very careful in those days. Anyway, my mother, even when I was a young child, when we used to go out, I know my mother used to say, if you see Mr. Price or his car, bow towards it. That's what she thought, but I've never bowed to anybody yet. <laughs> So the theme of resistance to the family in the big house at Marks Hall, which was clearly seen in the local newspapers from the 1860s, was also alive and well uh, 80 years later, recovered through oral history. So I hope you found that entertaining. Um, we are now, you can ask, we put a time for one or two questions now, um, if anybody has any they'd like to ask. Can I just ask? Yes. Okay. Okay, we've got a question, if you didn't hear at the back, about the, the, oh, the Tudor house maybe being, uh, uh, being replaced by, certainly being replaced by the house that was demolished. Would this have any, would this, the sighting of this house have any effect on some of the questions I've raised? I don't know if the archaeologists are going to stand up and, and dispute this with me, but we originally thought that the 17th century house was put at the front of the original house. But I think the archaeologists are maybe questioning, am I right? Anybody here who's going to put their head above the parapet? Maybe questioning whether, in fact, some of the, um, some of the fabric of the older house was under the foundations of the newer house. But it's still the same site. I mean, I guess it's south-facing. It's got wonderful views down towards Coggeshall. Uh, it's probably the healthy site, you know, up, up away from the river. Um, I don't think the house site has moved very much. No, just a matter of metres. Mm. Yeah, well, they were, yes. Yes, that's true. That's certainly true, yes. A question at the back. I'm going to come forward because I may not be able to hear you, so I'll come, I'll come and hear what you say, and then I'll come back and translate it. I did a perambulation walk yesterday, and we passed Hoochins Farm as, as, as uh, part of the perambulation. Thirteen and a half miles I did, so, yes. Um, the question was whether Hoochins Farm, you connected that to General Fairfax? I don't know anything about that connection. Um, had anything to do with it. Can anybody in the audience answer that question? Because I certainly can't. Yes, Fairfax said the Civil War chapter. Well, there is, yes, yes. Well, the, um, the army or some part of it that was besieging Colchester began, you know, drew up here. And there is this story that the, they kept the soldiers from rioting and being naughty by making them dig the ponds. I don't know. How do you date a pond if it's not on a map? Um, it's plausible, but who knows? Uh, I don't know about, yes, Sorry. you're going to have to shout. <laughs> No, no. Um, 
I've got the wrong hoochins, have I? Yes, yes. I, I haven't got the wrong farm. Yes. It's a beautiful house. I don't know this story. I mean, we clearly wondered about doing the Civil War story when, when we, we plumped to do the demolition story. But if we can find evidence of this, you know, we will look for it at some point. Uh, Yes. 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 I mean, common sense tells you that the obvious approach to Mark Saul is from the south, clearly, but I'm just kind of questioning from some of the things I've read, whether, in fact, that changed at some point. OK, I think we don't have time for more questions now, because what we're doing, are you going to explain what we're doing next, James? Excellent. Well, first of all, I just want to thank again. I want to thank Jane very much indeed. <laughs> for, I think, so brilliantly demonstrating how oral history and those testimonies, and we hope that many of you will speak to Jane and us during the course of the day, how they can illuminate so wonderfully the social history of this estate and of this house. And I think it may also have sort of, sort of brought little questions to mind in all of you. I, I suddenly sat there, for example, thinking, well, I've always thought sort of rather naively, oh, my great-great-grandfather, he obviously th found something better to do because he became a policeman after he left the estate, and I thought it was all rather poor. Possibly he failed to bow or something and was, <laughs> and had, and as a member of a Coggeshall family, you know, for many, many, many generations, he had that sort of Coggeshall truculence that was obviously part of the tension that Jane has so marvellously described. So I hope that if there's some existing truculence today here, you might also sort of question when I said, you know, that I thought the mansion house was a bit... Um, Ugly. That was deliberately provocative. I'm not sure about that. All that brick and other things and around it. And as I said, anyway, anyway, thank you, Jane, very much indeed. Now it's a beautiful day. Um, for those of you who haven't been to the estate before, and there are some, then I would encourage you to use the time also to explore the estate more generally, because um, the the walled garden beyond, a bit further along along the, the the lakes, is an absolute must to visit, and also through some of the further walks through the estate. But uh, now we're going to concentrate on the site of, mainly the site of interest that we've been talking about, of where the mansion house stood, which is pretty obvious when you go out because you can see the mound and there's nothing on it. Um, so we can go up there and look at the progress of the dig and talk about what we plan to do and what we have been doing but also incorporate to some of the sites of the Second World War, and we're going to move on this afternoon to talk about the World War II story and uh, about comparative uh, Second World War archaeological and oral history too. And so we want to, to uh, show you some of the bunkers and some of the existing and ex the extraordinary story that there is there. I mean, how everything was built so quickly and also how little we know really now about the just where it actually all was and, and is mapped. What we'll do um, for practical terms, because I know some of you don't, w would prefer a shorter walk than a longer walk, is that we'll divide into two parties. Um, if you would like to go directly and just to uh, the mansion house site up the hill, that party will be led by Jane uh, and one of the other team. We haven't quite sorted out which, but... And the uh, slightly longer walk, which will um, go, first of all, to the see some of the past, um, we have to be a bit careful, I, I'll, I'll get some advice actually here from Jonathan and others because there are bat colonies in, the, in some of the bunkers so we'll have to be a bit careful but we'll go through part of the 
uh, exposed walk and to see where some of the, the World War II sites are still amongst the trees. And then in due course, we will also come up to the Mansion House site as well. So you'll see the Mansion House site too. And I'll lead that party. And we'll lead from out there now. We'll split into the sort of the two groups. And there are also uh, two buggies for those who would like to go in the buggy rather than to walk, which are available, um, Julia tells me as well, out there for those who would prefer to go up by buggy. So we'll do that now. And then, I'm sorry? And then lunch, yeah, just about, I was looking, I was just checking the time. Lunch is back here at quarter past one.